Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Well, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today, we're going to look at Exodus 20, verse 3. Just a reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and theology. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes every day. And also, just as a reminder, in light of what I just said, uh, we're in the middle of a very brief series that's going to last about a week or so, just focusing on talking about the Ten Commandments and making sure that we really understand what they mean and why they're so important. So let's look today at our one verse, Exodus 20, verse 3. Exodus 20, verse 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. So this is our reading today from God's Word. You know, one of the very first lessons parents try to teach their children is how to share. Fathers and mothers are forever reminding their sons and daughters to share their space, share their toys, and share their food. You have to share, they said. And as important as it is to learn to share, it is also important to realize that some things are not meant to be shared. A bite-sized candy bar, for example, or a unicycle, or a, a piece of confidential information, like the answers to a test. Or, to even take a more serious example, the sexual love between a husband and a wife, because they are in covenant uh, in marriage between one man and one woman for life under God. These things were never intended to be shared with somebody else. And so, in order to be used properly at all, they have to be kept exclusive. Now, if some things were never meant to be shared, then it is not surprising at all to learn that there are times when even God refuses to share. He's a loving and a merciful God who loves to pour out his mercy and grace on his people. But there are some things that he will not share. And this is especially true when it comes to the prerogatives of his deity. God will not share his glory with any other God. And so he has given us this command in Exodus 23. You shall have no other gods before me. And this is the fundamental commandment, the one that comes before all the others and lays the foundation for them. And so before we can learn anything else about what God demands, we need to know who he is and who we are in relation to him. Now get this straight. This is what the Lord is saying in this commandment. I am the one and the only God. And since I am the only God, I refuse to share my worship with anyone or anyone else and anything else. God will not share the stage with any other performers. He refuses to have any colleagues. He will not even acknowledge that he has any genuine rivals. God does not simply lay claim to one part of our life and our worship. He demands that we dedicate all that we are and all that we have to his service and to his praise. And so the Ten Commandments begin by asserting the great theological principle of sola deo gloria to the glory of God alone. Now, in order to understand the first commandment, it helps to know the context in which it was given. The Israelites had just come out of Egypt, where they had lived in one of the most polytheistic cultures ever. Polytheism is simply the worship of many gods, and in this, the Egyptians were unsurpassed. They worshiped the gods of fields and rivers, light and darkness, sun and storm. And swearing their allegiance to the gods and goddesses of love and war, they bowed down to worship idols in the form of men and beasts. Now, the Israelites worshipped these gods, too. Over the long centuries of their captivity, they had gradually given in to the temptation to worship strange gods. God, in fact, told them, Each of you, get rid of vile images you have set your eyes on, and do not defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But he lamented, they rebelled against me and, and would not listen to me. They did not get rid of the vile images they had set their eyes on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt in Ezekiel 27 through 8. 
And so like the Egyptians, the Israelites worship many gods. And as for God, he has always been a monotheist. He has only ever believed in one God. And so the first commandment, he took his stand against the gods of Egypt and against every false deity, past, present, and future, when he said in Exodus 20 verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, he's saying, I am to be your one and only God. Now, this command was not without precedence. None of the other nations in the ancient world prohibited the worship of other gods. And so they simply assumed that every nation would serve its own deities. But on this issue, the God of Israel was completely intolerant. He refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of any other God. Now, what gives God the right to make this kind of demand? He's God. He is the sovereign covenant Lord. And remember how the first commandment is introduced in Exodus 20, uh, two through three. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And so what God commanded was based on who he was and what he had done. God had saved his people for his own glory. And now he was saying to them as the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, it is my right to rule over you. But even more than this, I'm your very own God. See, we are bound together by my covenant promise, says the Lord, and I have redeemed you. I have released you from your bondage to Pharaoh. With ten mighty plagues, I defeated all the deities of Egypt, showing that I am the one and the only and the true God. And now I lay my claim, the Lord is saying, to all of your worship and all of your praise. Because of who the Lord is, on the basis of what he's done, he is not going to share his glory with any other God. And so, if God is the only true God, then why does he speak of other gods as if they had any real existence? Well, the Bible insists that there is only one God and that every other deity is a fraud. As God has said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 45, 21, There is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none but me. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 says, We know that an idol is nothing, wrote the Apostle Paul, and that there is no God but one. And since that's true, then what is the point in telling us not to have any other gods? And if there aren't any other gods to begin with, then how could we have another one? The answer is, is that even false gods hold a kind of spiritual power over their worshipers. Now, people worship powerful forces within creation as if they were deities. They're not gods, but only so-called gods. Still, they have very real powers even to enslave a person totally. As Paul reminded the Galatians in Galatians 4.8, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. Now, the reason false gods have this enslaving power is ultimately because demonic forces use them to gain mastery over their worshipers. And so all the gods of Egypt held real spiritual power over the minds and the hearts of the Egyptians and also the Israelites. This is why God took the trouble to defeat them one by one. It was to break their spiritual influence and thereby to show that he alone was worthy of worship. Now, the first commandment comes from God, who is our Lord and Savior and King. But what about the commandment itself? What can we learn from the way it's worded, specifically from its last phrase? God said, you shall have no other gods before me in Exodus 23. This does not mean that it is permissible to worship other deities as long as we put the Lord first. When God says before me, he's not trying to tell us where he falls in the rankings. But, but what is he trying to say? Well, the words before me mean before my face. Sometimes they're used in a spatial sense. And in that case, the, the commandment would mean something like this. You shall have no other gods in, in front of me or in my presence. And taken literally, this would forbid people from bringing foreign idols into the place where God is to be worshipped. But since God is everywhere, it, it really forbids us from worshiping false gods anywhere. Anytime we serve any other God, we're doing it in the presence of God. The word before can also be used to describe two things that are in opposition to one another. And so in that case, the commandment would read, you shall not have any gods over against me. And here the picture is that of putting one thing in the face of another. 
In other words, setting up a false deity is like insulting God to his face. And obviously, before is a flexible word. And although it is hard to decide how it's used here, both of the possible meanings are biblically correct. So no matter where we do it, we are not allowed to serve anyone or anything besides God. To do such a thing is to set ourselves against him and against his commandment. And, and the point is, is that when it comes to worshiping God, it is all or nothing. This is the way it has always been. It has always been this way on Mount Sinai when God first gave Moses the law. It was this way when Joshua renewed the covenant and said in Joshua 24, 14 through 15, Throw away the gods of your forefathers uh, worshipped in Egypt and serve the Lord. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. This is the way it was on Mount Carmel when Elijah liberated the Israelites from their bondage to Baal. He said this in 1 Kings 18.21. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Now, it is the same way with Jesus Christ who says in Matthew 6.24, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. God's people have always faced a choice. Religious pluralism is not a recent development. There's always been plenty of other gods clamoring for our attention, and God has always demanded exclusive loyalty. Now, when God commands us to reject false gods, he's also commanding us to choose him as a true God, enthroning him as our only Lord and King. John Calvin said the first commandment requires us to contemplate, to fear, and even worship his majesty, to participate in his blessings, to seek his help at all times, to recognize and by praises to celebrate the greatness of his works as the only goal of all the activities of life. And so the command tells us whom to worship as well as to whom not to worship. It's positive as well as negative. For its positive statement, consider the creed that most Israelites recited every day. In Deuteronomy 6, 4-5, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. Love is the right word to use because the first commandment it solidifies the covenant relationship between God and his people. And now notice that in this commandment, God speaks to us in the singular. God says, you individually shall have no other gods before me personally. We do not worship a God, but the God. And he wants us to have an exclusive love relationship with each one of his people. And so obviously, in order for this relationship to work, it is essential for us not to share our love with any other God. We must be faithful to the only true God. You must give him our total allegiance, honoring, adoring, and revering him as our Lord and Savior. And so the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. But what happens when we break that commandment? There is a story about violating the first commandment in the Bible. It is a story of a tragic downfall of a great king. In fact, he is one of the greatest kings in ancient world. He was powerful, the most powerful king his nation had ever known. He had horses and chariots by the thousands. He crushed his enemies, expanding his kingdom until it stretched from the mountains to the sea. He was also the wealthiest king his nation had ever seen. His place was filled with gold, but not with silver, which during his reign was considered too common for royal use. The name of this rich and powerful king was Solomon. Now, the most remarkable thing about Solomon was that he possessed true spiritual wisdom. In the early days of his reign, God appeared to him in a dream and said, ask for whatever you want me to give you in 1 Kings 3, 5. It was the opportunity of a lifetime, right? The king could ask for anything he wanted, and his answer would reveal what God he wanted to serve. If he served riches, he would ask for gold. If he served power, he would ask for death to his enemies. If he served pleasure, he would ask for beautiful women. But Solomon wanted to serve the one and the only true God. And so he asked for wisdom to rule his people in righteousness. God granted the king's request. Solomon was recognized as the wisest man in the ancient world, and people came from all over to test his knowledge. The Bible tells how he judged between right and wrong, and how he served as a counselor to kings and queens. Now, in his wisdom, Solomon did many great things for God. He was generous. He he built a temple in the honor of God. He was also a man of prayer. The magnificent prayer he offered at the dedication of the temple could only have come from a man who knew the word of God and understood the character of God, as we see in Second Chronicles 6. And you see, God answered Solomon's prayer by descending on his temple in power and glory. 
There has never been a man more greatly blessed than King Solomon. He had everything a person could ever want, including the opportunity to do great things for God. Now, if only Solomon had kept the first commandment, God said to him, as for you, if you walk before me in integrity of heart and uprightness as David, your father did, and do all that I commanded and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your throne, royal throne uh, over Israel forever. But if you turn, turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name in 1 Kings 9, 4 through 7. Well, it's very simple. All Solomon had to do was give God the glory. And in particular, he had first to obey the first commandment by refusing to serve any other gods. Well, sadly, Solomon failed to keep the law of God. He served other gods. The scripture tells us this in 1 Kings 11.5. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Amorites. It also tells us how God responded in 1 Kings 11.9-11, when it says, The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. And so the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you. See, King Solomon was roundly condemned specifically for violating the first commandment. Now, most people are surprised by what happened to Solomon. The collapse of his kingdom comes as a real shock. How could a wise man so wise be so foolish? And yet, if we look at Solomon's life carefully, we see that his heart started to turn away from God long before he ever bowed down in front of any idols. You know, Solomon started well, but gradually he drifted away until finally he was worshiping completely different deities. The same thing happens to many Christians today. And although we never intended to break the first commandment, our hearts are lured away by temptation to follow other gods. And what is so tragic about King Solomon is that he ended up serving the very gods he had once rejected. He did not ask God for gold, and yet in time, he started serving the God of wealth. The best example of this comes in 1 Kings 7, which describes how he built his palace. Chapter 6 tells us how Solomon built a house for God and ends by saying that he spent seven years building it in 1 Kings 6, 38. And then the king built a house for himself. 1 Kings 7 begins with the words that can only be interpreted as a, as a reproach in 1 Kings 7, 1. It took Solomon 13 years, however, to complete the construction of his palace. And once the king had done something for God, he decided it was time to do something for himself. And he took almost twice as long doing it. Now this shows how dangerous it is to be rich. Money brings many temptations, and even if we resist them at the beginning, they come back to destroy us in the end. Now, Solomon also began to worship power. Again, this was not something he asked for, but in the time that he started serving the God of military strength. God had specifically forbidden the Israelites to build up a Calvary in Deuteronomy 17, 16. And yet Solomon amassed an entire army of horses and chariots in 1 Kings 10, 26 through 29. Now, he made the same mistake when it came to women. At Deuteronomy 17:17 17, 17 says this, the king must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. And yet Solomon failed to heed God's warning. And although at the beginning he did not ask for pleasure, he started serving the goddess of sex, and that was his downfall, according to 1 Kings 11:1 1 through 3. King Solomon loved foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. And yet Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray, according to 1 Kings 11, 1 through 3. And some of these wives were acquired to satisfy his political ambitions. They helped him form strategic alliances. But most of them were acquired to satisfy his sexual addiction, his sexual enslavement. Solomon had the wealth and power to pursue pleasure to its limits. And all the while, he was following after other gods until finally he suffered the ultimate spiritual degradation. He bowed down to blocks of wood and stone. 
God punished Solomon by tearing apart his kingdom, but this is not the real tragedy. The real tragedy was not the punishment, but the sin itself, the sin of breaking the first commandment. Solomon discovered to his own dismay how empty life is for those who follow other gods. And later when he looked back on what he had done, he said in Ecclesiastes 2.1, I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. And then he describes his royal project in Ecclesiastes 4 through 8, which says this, I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I, I brought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and, and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harm as well. The delights of the heart of man. You know, Solomon had it all. This was Solomon's grand experiment, the pursuit of other gods. And he summed it up by saying in Ecclesiastes 2.10, I deny myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. And what was the result? Was he satisfied? Did he get what he wanted? Was it worth it? No. His pursuit of power, pleasure, prosperity, it led him into emptiness and despair. And so he said, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me in Ecclesiastes 2.11 and Ecclesiastes 2.17. Now, this is what happens to everyone who breaks the first commandment. In the end, of course, those who follow other gods will be judged for their sin, as Solomon was. But long before judgment, there was emptiness and despair. You see, the desire to have more and more is insatiable. But the shiny new products and the exciting new experiences cannot quiet the nagging doubt. Is this all there is? Isn't there something more to life? You see, when we break the first commandment, we discover other gods do not satisfy and they can't save. How, how weak the gods of this world are, wrote Elizabeth Barrett Browning in a poem called Idols. And she says, weaker yet, their worship made me. Now you see, the story of Solomon is a warning to everyone who has made a decision to follow the Lord, but is gradually coming under the influence of other gods. See, many people today, they assume that adultery is a thing of the past. Who would ever bow down to a figure made of wood or stone? It sounds so primitive, but the truth is that the spirit of Solomon is alive and well today. We may not worship Astareth anymore or Moloch, but we do worship other deities. And in many cases, we can serve exactly the same gods that Solomon served, money, sex, and power. How do we identify our own private idolatries? Well, there's two tests that we can use to determine which gods we are tempted to worship. One is the love test. What do we love the most? Now, we can look at Origen, that third century theologian who observed that the first commandment has to do with what we love. Origen wrote, what each one honors before all else, what before all things he admires and loves, this for him is God. Well, it only makes sense. We are called to love God with all of our hearts, with all of our minds. But if instead we give our love to someone or something else, then we are serving some other God. So what do you love? Or to ask the same question a different way, what do you desire? When your mind is free to roam, what do you think about the most? How do you spend money? What do you get excited about? A false God could be anything good that we focus on to the exclusion of the Lord. It could be a sport. It could be a recreation. It could be a hobby or even a personal interest. It could be an appetite for the finer things in life. It could be a career ambition. It could be a personal health and fitness. It could be a ministry in the church. Well, certainly we are allowed to enjoy the good things in life, but we must not allow them to replace God as the object of our affections. Another test is the trust test. What do you trust? What do you turn to in times of trouble? Martin Luther said this, whatever thy heart clings to and relies upon, that is properly thy God. In fact, the Puritan Thomas Watson says to trust in anything more than God is to make it a God. And that makes sense too. We are called to trust in God alone for our salvation. But if we put our trust in someone or something else, we are serving some other God. What do you trust today? 
some trust in their enslavements, those things that, frankly, that they love and value the most. And when they're in trouble, when they're lonely, when they're discouraged, they count on drugs and alcohol or sex or shopping or some other obsession to pull them through. Uh, Other people trust things that are good in themselves, but that nevertheless have a way of replacing our confidence in the Lord. Some trust their jobs, their insurance policies, or even their pension plans for their security. Some even put their faith in government and its control of the economy. Some trust their families or their social position. Some trust science and medicine. God can use all of these things to care for and even provide for us, but we are to place our ultimate confidence in the Lord alone. The truth is, is that we're tempted to love and to trust many things other than God. The Puritan Matthew Henry said, Pride maketh a God of self, covetous makes a God of money, sensuality makes a God of the belly. Whatever is esteemed or loved, feared or served, delighted in or dependent on more than God, whatever it is, we do in effect make a God of. There are many examples of this kind of reasoning in the Bible. Job said this, If I have put my trust in gold or said to pure gold, You are my security, then these also would be sins to be judged, for I would have been unfaithful to God on high. In Job 31, 24 and Job 31, 28. The prophet Habakkuk described God's enemies as people whose own strength is our God in Habakkuk 1, 11. The apostle Paul was even more blunt, saying of the enemies of Christ, their God is at their stomach in Philippians 3.19. Now, whether it's money, power, or even your own belly, the world is full of God's substitutes and God additives, things that take the place of God in daily life. And the reason we have trouble recognizing our own private idolatries is not because we don't have any false gods anymore, but because we have so many. Beside all the lesser idols we serve in in the God or goddess of self, the supreme deity of these postmodern times. In his famous study of American religion, Robert Bella recounted an interview with a woman named Sheila Larson. Sheila was the ultimate individualist. She, She said, I believe in God. I'm not a religious fanatic. I can't remember the last time I went to church. My faith has carried me a long way. It's Sheilism, just my own little voice. And Bella comments, this suggests the logical possibility of over 220 million American religions, one for each of us. What do we love? We are infatuated with ourselves. Whom do we trust? We believe in ourselves. See, Christians are as prone to this kind of false worship as anyone else. We say that we want to serve God, but we spend most of our time thinking about our own needs, our own plans, our own problems and desires. We have discovered, as Oscar Wilde famously wrote, that to oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance. Now, what can deliver us from the worship of self and the other gods that we are tempted to serve? Rolling Stone magazine asked this question back in December of 1992. Thou shall not worship false idols, the editors wrote, slightly misquoting the scripture. But who else is there? Now, the only answer is to fall passionately and deeply in love with the Lord God, specifically by trusting in his son, Jesus Christ. The only thing that can tear our hearts away from all the other affections is true love for God. And the only thing that can replace all the other things we trust is a total faith commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, scripture teaches that there is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is God the Son, and since there is only one true God, he is one with the Father, as John 10.30 says. God is overall, as Romans 9.5 says. Therefore, to worship Jesus is not to worship some other God, but to worship the one and only God, according to John 1.14. Jesus makes the same claim on us that God has always made. As Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. Uh, Hosea 13, 4 says, You shall acknowledge no God but me, no Savior except me. Jesus calls us to turn away from everything else we're tempted to worship and to give him the glory due to his name. It's becoming increasingly common for people to claim that there are many ways to God. Pluralism has come to America, where there are now more than 600 non-Christian religions. With so many options, people say it doesn't really matter which religion we choose as long as our faith is right for us. It's fine to follow Christ, but only if we recognize that he is not the only God. Even in the church today, there are some people who say that Jesus Christ is a savior, but not the savior. This pluralistic approach to religion is a direct attack on the first commandment in which we are commanded to worship God alone. Now, God is as 
intolerant today as he ever was. To deny that Jesus is the only way is to say there are other gods. But there are no other gods. This false theology must be rejected both for the honor of Christ and for the keeping of the first commandment. Jesus claims exclusive rights to our worship. And he is not simply one among many prophets. He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, according to John 14, 6. He is the only incarnate Son of God. He alone kept the whole law for the people of God, offered a perfect sacrifice for our sins, and was raised from the dead to open the eternal way to eternal life and so the lord alone deserves all the praise and now it's not simply our duty to worship christ as the only god it's also our privilege he alone is our savior and our lord and so we make it our aim to please him in all of our work and all of our play and all that we do we worship him and adore him we trust him we thank him and he says this i am the lord your god who brought you out of your bondage to sin out of your slavery to satan you shall have no other gods before me well i want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of reading the bible daily with dave my name is dave and and we've looked at exodus 20 verse 3 until tomorrow may the lord richly bless you and keep you Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.